Hello, and welcome back to Genochemistry 2. My name is Daniel, and in this video we're going to be talking about the transition metals, that is the d-block elements, and what's called coordination compounds that these elements form. So we're going to see what these coordination compounds are. We're first going to briefly review the transition metals, how their electron configurations, their properties work out. And then we're going to go into naming these kinds of compounds, the isomers they can form, and then some of the electronic structure of these compounds. And we'll see how that applies to some of the properties that they exhibit. So first, let's start by just reviewing the d-block elements. So we've took a, I took out a snippet of the periodic table here that shows them. We have um, the 3D elements, the 4D, 5D, 6D. And then remember that these little inserts bring us to the F block elements. So down here is 4F, down here is 5F. So the valence electrons for these D block elements that we're going to be primarily talking about are all located in the D orbitals, whether they be 3D, 4D, 5D, depending on the period. The elements in the same period and same group tend to exhibit somewhat similar properties, but throughout the entirety of the transition metals themselves, there's a high variation of properties. One example of this is the melting points of some of them. If you look down here, tungsten has a melting point of 3400 degrees Celsius, whereas something like mercury only has one of 25 degrees Celsius. We know that mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Other t other properties deal with the strength and the ductility of the materials. Iron and titanium are hard and strong, whereas something like gold and copper are relatively soft and ductile and malleable because we can form them into coins, wires, what have you. And then others have different properties of reactivity. For example, some transition metals react readily with oxygen, and then there are some called noble metals that barely react with oxygen at all. Some of those noble metals are iridium, platinum, Gold is considered one, palladium, rhenium. Uh, those in that general area are, tend to be non-reactive. So we're going to primarily focus, when we're talking about our coordination compounds, on the, the 3D elements. We can assume, however, that these are, for the most part, going to apply to the 4D and 5D elements as well, when we're talking about the compounds that we form. So let's look at what exactly a coordination compound is. So first off, we know that a lot of transition metal compounds are characterized by having multiple oxidation states. For example, iron comes in iron plus 2 and iron plus 3, and you can see they form different stoichiometries of their oxides as a result. The same thing is going to apply in these compounds called complex ions. So briefly, what a complex ion is, is just a metal cation center, and attached to it are what's called ligands. These ligands are Lewis bases that attack the metal center as a Lewis acid. So these ligands are characterized by having lone pair electrons. It's these lone pair electrons that allow them to act as a Lewis base and then bond to the metal. So here we have what's called the CONH36 plus 3 ion. So this entire species is just an ionic species plus three charge. So we see that cobalt is in the center, and then we have these ammonia ligands uh, bonded to it. And this forms an octahedral, uh, octahedral kind of geometry, which is characterized by the blue dashed lines. And so this ion will act as any other kind of ion. It can dissolve in, sol it'll dissolve in solution, it'll conduct electricity, and so on and so forth. We'll get into some more details about the individual properties later on in the video. For now, I just want to review the electron configuration of these transition metals, because it's going to be important for us when we're talking about the properties of coordination compounds. So hopefully you remember this. This is just uh, going to be an application of the Aufbau principle, where we're filling in the electrons that are in the valence electron shell of each of these compounds. So. Recall that first off, we have a group one element that just has one electron. If we wanted to fill that in, we would just put in one 4s electron. And then in group two, for calcium, we put in two 4s electrons. And that's where we get into the 3D elements. So the 3D elements all have full 4s shells. So scandium, for example, is going to have two electrons in the 4s 
and then it also has one in the 3D. The same thing's going to apply for titanium. And remember that we have to fill each of the orbitals with one electron before we fill them up completely. Vandium, we'll just have another. And now chromium, you'll recall, is one of the exceptions to our rule here. What will happen in chromium is that one of the 4s electrons will transfer to the 3d, and we'll see that we have a half-filled 3d orbital as a result. The reason for this being because the half-filled 3d orbital is an electronically stable configuration, and so it's uh, preferred to have that half-filled as opposed to almost half-filled. We go on to manganese, it'll put it, that an extra electron into the 4s while also having 5d electrons. Now we go into iron, and we start filling up the orbitals completely. And we'll do the same thing for cobalt and nickel. And then we go to copper, where we have a, another exception. We're going to have just one 4s electron and then a fully filled d orbital for the same reasons as chromium. And then finally, zinc has a full 3d shell and a full um, 4s shell as well. OK, so those are just for the neutral compounds. What we'll notice is that the transition metal ions are going to usually not have any 4s electrons. The reason being that the 4s electrons have a higher n number. This is n equals 4 as opposed to n equals 3. And so when we take away electrons to form a cation, we're going to take them away from the 4s um, orbital first. So let's go into some problems about the electron configuration of some of these ions. You should be able to do this. So just uh, pause the video and give the electron configuration for each of these metal ions. OK, so let's take a look at each of these. We're going to start each by giving the atomic, just the electron configuration of the atom by itself. So for the first one, for manganese, we saw in the previous slide that it has 4s2 and 3d5. And we put an argon in front of it. So if we form Mn plus 2, we're going to just take away these 4s electrons. And that'll give us the same configuration, except now it's just 3d5. We can do the same thing in nickel. So nickel as a metal is just AR 4s2 3d8. So then if we form an, an I plus 2, it's just simply going to be 3d8. And then finally, for Fe plus 3, we have iron metal is just Ar 4s2 3d6. Then we take away three electrons. So that's two from the 4s and then one from the 3d. And that leaves us with 3d5. You can also see that Fe plus 3 is isoelectronic with mn plus 2, meaning they have the same electron configuration. OK, so this is going to prove important to us when we're looking at the energy diagrams of these complex ions, how we can sort out the 3d electrons within their orbitals. But we'll get to that later in the video. Let's get into uh, talking about what exactly a coordination compound is. So a few slides ago, we talked about the complex ions, how their metal centers bonded to ligands. But the coordination compound has to have a counter ion. You know, we can't just have a solid ion um, just sitting in the solid phase. It has to be bound with um, some counter ion, something with an opposite charge. And so a co coordination compound is the pairing of a complex ion with a what's called a counter ion with opposite charge. For example, if we look at our